Welcome to a journey through time and tradition. Uncover the rich and important history of the tribe of Judah. From ancient origins to modern significance, this video delves deep into the legacy and impact of one of history's most intriguing tribes. Get ready to be captivated, to be enlightened, and to discover the untold stories that have shaped generations. Join us as we unravel the mysteries of the tribe of Judah, a tale of power, pride, and perseverance. Stay tuned for an adventure like no other. For now let's travel back to where Judah was born. Judah was born in Paddan Aram, which is modern-day Turkey. In the book of Genesis, the tribe of Judah gets its name from a significant event involving Jacob, one of the patriarchs of the Israelites. Judah was the fourth son of Jacob and Leah, his first wife. When Judah was born, Leah praised the Lord, which is where the name Judah comes from. The name Judah itself means, praise, in Hebrew. Judah, a significant figure in the Bible, was born to Leah, one of the wives of Jacob, in Genesis 29. The circumstances surrounding his birth were marked by the complex dynamics of the relationship between Jacob and his two wives, Leah and Rachel. Jacob initially loved Rachel and worked seven years to marry her, only to be tricked into marrying Leah, Rachel's older sister, first. This deception led to a strained relationship between the two wives as they competed for Jacob's affection. Despite the rivalry and jealousy between Leah and Rachel, they both played crucial roles in the birth of Judah and his brothers. Leah, who was initially unloved by Jacob, bore him many children, including Judah. One of the most prominent locations in the history of the tribe of Judah is the ancient city of Jerusalem, which served as the tribe's central hub and later became the capital of the kingdom of Judah. Throughout history, the tribe of Judah played a significant role in the formation of the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. King David, a member of the tribe of Judah, established Jerusalem as the capital, and his son, King Solomon, built the first temple there. The Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in 586 BCE led to the exile of many Judeans to Babylon, marking a pivotal moment in the tribe's history. Here are three stories that came through the tribe of Judah. The story of Ruth and Boaz. Ruth, a Moabite woman, widowed and loyal to her Israelite mother-in-law Naomi, gleaned in the fields of Boaz, a wealthy landowner from the tribe of Judah. Boaz noticed Ruth's dedication and kindness, and he showed her favor, allowing her to gather grain freely. Impressed by her character, Boaz eventually married Ruth, and their union became an integral part of the lineage leading to King David, and eventually, Jesus Christ. The Tale of Samson Samson, born to Manoah and his wife from the tribe of Dan, grew up as a Nazirite with incredible strength. However, his connection to the tribe of Judah is through his marriage to a Philistine woman from Timnah. Despite the tensions between the Israelites and Philistines, Samson's exploits, including defeating a lion with his bare hands and defeating a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey, brought him fame. Yet, his downfall came through his love for Delilah, a Philistine woman who betrayed him, leading to his capture and death. The Journey of King Solomon Solomon, the son of King David and Bathsheba, hailed from the tribe of Judah. After ascending to the throne, he sought wisdom from God, which earned him renown throughout the ancient world. One of his most famous acts of wisdom was the judgment between two women claiming to be the mother of the same baby, where he suggested dividing the child in half to reveal the true mother's love. Solomon also initiated the construction of the temple in Jerusalem, which became the center of Israelite worship. His reign marked a period of peace and prosperity for the kingdom of Israel. Thank you for visiting the Family of Judah video series. Since you made it this far, you're probably seeking some type of truth. Well, we have scoured countless hours of video footage, read articles, read the Bible, to try to be able to provide you with some type of information that you can use so that you will understand 
that you are more than what is portrayed on television and in the media. So we only have a few goals and objectives on this channel. And that is to make sure Yah gets his praise and glory. Number two, to present facts and truth so that you can use that to make up your own mind, do your own research. Three, to be positive and to present at least one Bible verse written or spoken to this world. So we hope you enjoy the rest of our video. If you have any questions, comments, or concern, please leave them in the comments section below. Um, praise Yah, Judah will rise again. Okay, so I've learned a few things. How does that help me now? I'm worried about gas prices. I can't afford groceries. I'm possibly going to get laid off from my job. I'm worried about feeding my kids. My marriage is breaking up. I don't have time to go to church. I'm tired it's my only day to sleep in. I don't really believe in all that Bible stuff anyway. joined by Rabbi Harry Rosenberg, who does a lot of very interesting work in uh, the story of the, the Lost Tribes of Israel, and we are very happy to have him back in the studio. Hello, and good to see you. Wonderful to be back. So we just had a very interesting uh, interview uh, before the commercial break with an anthropologist and a community leader of the Lemba community in Zimbabwe. You talk a lot about, about this, you do a lot of coursework. What do you have to say first about, about the Lemba and what makes them unique as opposed to some of the other groups that are considered Lost Tribes? Correct. Uh, Lemba are fascinatingly unique because we could trace them directly to the oldest Jewish exile community in the world from Yemen. And Ye the Yemenite Jewish community, when they came back to Israel, they had customs that were preserved for 2,000 years uninterrupted. Even some of their pronunciation of Hebrew letters were unique as far as how the Ashkenazim and Sephardim pronounced their letters, but no one challenged them saying it's unauthentic. It was as authentic it can get. Mm -hmm. And so when you see the Lemba all the way down to the bottom of Africa, you know, tracing their roots uh, to the Yemenite Jewish community, building in the same structures and having certain uh, you know, traditions that are the same, and no, like no one else in South Africa, it shows you the far-reaching scale of these Israelite uh, customs and traditions. And not to mention, obviously, we speak about the genetic Kohen phenomenon amongst the Lemba people, that uh, a large percentage of them have a genetic marker to be from the Kohanim, from the priests of Israel. That those were scattered to the nations. Part of those, of course, went into Africa. Now, Af Israel wasn't originally called Israel. It was called Greater Africa. So these are the points that I begin to lay out. I begin to associate with the culture and reach into the culture itself because its history is very deep. While in that course in West Africa, um, we talk about the history of that and we uh, talk about Dahomey and, and Benin, West Africa, and the three things that uh, they attempted to do upon the black men and that is in the black women, and that uh, is they walked around the tree, how many remember the Detroit Tribal Revival, and they put three potential, they were never cursed people, but potential curses on those people, and that is of sexual immorality, financial instability, and utter poverty, and that they would forget their roots and where they came from, and that's what I'm gonna be, my whole teaching today is on the third uh, one there that I wanna take a look at. Again, they put, they, they attempted to put a voodoo or obia curse on them of uh, sexual immorality, number two, financial instability and utter poverty, and number three, that they would forget their roots and where they came from. All right, let's go into culture. So how are we going to reach, how are we going to reach this specific culture? Watch what happens. Now, we're going to pull up and we're going to talk about history. And we have to go back into their history to explain where they came from. And number two, in America, because we live in a democracy slash republic, Many of you start out in the very beginning like, I don't really care. But well, by the time it's done, trust me, their life has changed. Amen. Let's go in right now. Let's follow the narrator right now. This comes out of, part of it comes out of a narration in Torah 201. You saw some of this with the history of the African people in the Bible. And what are we doing now? What are we doing right now? We're going in to identify culture. Africa, then and now. In ancient 
biblical times, Africa was known by many names. Number one, Akibu Lan, mother of all mankind, Garden of Eden. Number two, Kemet. Three, Libya. Four, Artiga. Five, Corfi. Six, Egypt. Seven, Ethiopia. Eight, Sudan. Nine, Olympia. Ten, Hesperia. Eleven, Oceania. North Africa and Northeast Africa, now presently the Middle East, was linked by a strip of land called the Sinai Peninsula. The completion of the Suez Canal on November 17, 1869, severed the physical link that connected North Africa and Northeast Africa. The final separation came in World War II when the war correspondents coined the term Middle East to describe the area that now encompasses Israel, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Yemen, Kuwait, Bahrain, Iraq, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. Now, so what happened was, is that now we're going to set the stage right now, okay? Look at your notes again. So what, do we, what have we learned? That Africa not, did not have just the name Africa, isn't that right, right? It had several names. So that's really critical. We understand that. We become familiar with those terms. And I'll tell you, so that what? So that when you sit on a seat on an airplane, we begin to open up a discussion and we begin to dialogue with them. Now, Rabbi, why, why would you even concern them? I mean, like, who really cares about this? Well, in the last days is a prophecy. And we're seeing the prophecy being fulfilled. In Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 6, God said he's going to regather and ingather those who he has scattered to the nations. The Bible says he's going to bring them back to the land, making, uh, making an aliyah to the land, and they're going to have a greater heritage in the land. Isn't that right? Amen? Okay, we're going to stop right there. Now we're going to begin to take a look at the history of this. This is some great stuff if you can hang in there. So what I'm going to do right now from the beginning of Genesis all the way through, I'm going to show you the line of that most people do not understand. And when people say that um, color doesn't ma ma matter to them, but it matters to someone who is an inner city, who has went through a struggle, who every time they walked into place, they were the isolated people, and etc. How many know that? Amen? And so you have to identify with the culture. You have to love the culture. You have to have a passion for the culture. You have to be, become uh, knowledgeable of what, what's going on. Because sometimes the worst fight I find within the black culture is the black culture. <laughs> they all fight amongst each other. Amen? So a lot of times we've just got to have them understand that God has a covenant promise for these people. Amen. And their covenant promise, even though part of that curse of the Obia curse, again, they were never cursed people, is that they would forget their roots and where they came from. So when we were in Barbados, I asked the whole crowd, a large crowd there, I asked them a question. I said, how many of you um, know Moses? And they all raised a hand. I said, so I'm going to ask you a question. If I ask you this, when you envision this, okay, tell me what color skin he has. Okay, you can see here the pin drop in the place in here. What do you think they said? White. And I said, well, that's interesting. I said, if I ask you the name Joseph in the Bible, what color skin would you say? Now, this is an all-black culture. This is all-black community. Okay? What do you think they said? White. Okay? If I ask them, who enslaved you in Africa, who do you think they said? Wow. I told them, you flunked every exam. I'd like to bring up a few specific examples because they're going to be game changers. One of them wrote letters to Israel when it became a state. And they said, we're, uh, we're Israelites out in Africa. You know, everyone laughed at them and they said, African Israelites, these people are just trying to jump on the first world country bandwagon. They're living in a third world country, they got nothing. We're coming to Israel, we got innovation, technology. So they're trying to get on this train because there's such a thing called the right of return. All descendants of the Jewish people from around the world are able to move to Israel. So they they said we are also and everyone kind of laughed at them like I said and a few people took it serious and went out there and started studying them learned about their culture 
and a professor from Duke University went out there and did DNA testing on them. And he showed not only do they share Semitic genes from people who were in Yemen and back to the Middle East, these gentlemen, a large percent of them, have the Y chromosome to be Kohanim, to be priests. What? Your bloodline is priesthood? Priests. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, a priest is a specific family clan of the nation of Israel who come from Aaron, the brother of Moses, who was the first priest. And anyone descended from Aaron is, has the, the, the status title priest. And we found that these men in this village in South Africa called Lemba, L-E-M-B-A, carry this genetic marker to let us know that they share the same as from the Svartic and the Ashkenaz and, and the population of the people in Israel today, they share the same exact DNA marker. That's mind-blowing. So everyone kind of got humbled a little bit who, who laughed at them and said, now, now, now what? Now what do we do about this? This could have tremendous implications. What? Your bloodline is priesthood? Another area in Africa you have uh, something big happening is in Nigeria. You have the Igbo people, or Igbo, pronounced either way. There's 40 million of them, also Christians, like I spoke about before, how that could happen to the children of Israel very easily. But also a lot of them are now coming out and converting back or adopting the, the rules of the Torah without all the paganism that they've been practicing for hundreds of years. There's been books written about it from scholars in Nigeria, from scholars from the Jewish people. And where it gets interesting is, in America, there was a slave trade. And a lot of the slaves, a very high percentage of them, came from Western Nigerian ports. And in America today, you see a, a very large movement of African Americans who say that they're the real chosen people, that they're the children of Israel, they're the Judeans. You know, so what, are they just trying to create a, an identity for themselves because they were slaves? Or is there really something here? And the answer is, most likely there is something there. And most likely, maybe that they were the original Israelites. And maybe that the Jewish people today who are white Caucasian people um, came in a little bit later on. We know that some of the greatest sages of the transmission of the Torah were converts from Rome. You have a man named Unculus who, who wrote a commentary in the Torah, unprecedented, that we still learn today. He was a convert. Some of the largest pillars on the transmission today were Roman converts. So here we are, we're, you know, I'm speaking, we're Caucasian Jewish people. And now you have people in Africa saying that they're the real people of Israel. It can't be ruled out at all. We know they were sold into slavery. We know now that they're fulfilling prophecies by saying we're coming back. We want DNA research confirms that modern Khazarian Jews, these are the Khazars, are not the descendants of ancient Israel, of the Israelites, or the seed of Abraham. Okay, now you're going to be surprised at how many of the people that call themselves Jews are not Jews. They're fake Jews. They're Khazarians. First, let me, uh, when uh, you see Ashkenazic Jews sharing high similarity to Romanians and Hungarians, this is because both of these populations were offshoots of the, of the Khazars. Um, they were both founded by, by uh, these members of the Kafkazos who ruled uh, this area of uh, north of the Black Sea where we have South Russia nowadays, uh, between the 7th and uh, 13th centuries. A uh, very powerful empire, they converted to Judaism in the 8th century uh, and they sent offshoots to, to Eastern Europe. Um, and we still, some, some uh, Ashkenazic Jews are mapped to this, this region of Ukraine. They're not all mapped to, to Ashkenaz. Most of them are, but some of them are mapped to Ukraine and we can see very nicely some kind of migration route uh, using GPS. I why? I'm white, unseasoned, a Caucasian, Caucasian, 
Caucasian. I was told welcome home because I'm Jewish. Every single person who's Jewish that steps off the plane, especially for their first time in Israel, is told welcome home. Let's just sit with that for a second. This right here, this is my actual ancestry. I am 88% Ashkenazi Jewish, and none of my ancestors are from the Middle East. And this is an article by Text Mars, and they, I'm going to give you a site here to click on to go to it. Uh, the forward is, is uh, courtesy of Keith Howell, and I'm going to read, read it to you. Oh, it's going to take a while here, and the print's fairly small, but I'll read it right to you here. Uh, DNA research confirms that modern Khazarian Jews are not the descendants or of ancient Israelites or the seed of Abraham, March 8, 2013. And, uh, okay, this is websites given here to show you this. Uh, and here's a, you know, quote from scripture. I know the blasphemy of them which say, uh, which say they are Jews and are not but of the, of the synagogue of Satan, Revelation 2, verse 9. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto thy seed, Why give the land? Genesis 12, 7. Who shall possess the land of Israel? Uh, Christian evangel evangelicals say that uh, it should be the descendants of Abraham. They point to the Old Testament and claim that God gave that this land forever to the descendants of Abraham. And I agree with that. That God demands they and they alone own the land. And that's absolutely true. So to the Christian evangelical, this means the Jews. Yes, it is the Jews who own the land and it is their land forever. The Jews then, according to the Christian evangel evangelicals, are the descendants of Abraham, his seed. Now here's what DNA, DNA science confounds the common uh, wisdom. There is only one problem, and it is a huge one. Science proves those who call themselves Jews are not Jews. DNA science has confounded the Christian evangel evangelicals by proving conclusively that most of the people in the nation of Israel and in world Jewry are not the descendants of Abraham. What? The 16th century to the abolition of slavery in America, in 1865, some 12 and a half million Africans were torn from their families, homelands, and languages, forced into slavery in a triangular trade route known as the Middle Passage. The first leg of the passage witnessed the imprisonment of Africans after their capture by enemy tribes, before being traded for goods at African slave markets by European and American slave traders. Separated by sex, new slaves were crammed aboard ships known as Guineamen, who hailed mainly from ports in Portugal, Holland, France, England, and America. Packed into the unventilated holds of Guineamen, so tightly that people frequently lacked enough space to sit down or move around, during the approximate 80-day passage to North and South America, some 15% would die from dehydration, starvation, or disease. Those who survived would be sold at auction after their arrival into the Americas, while the proceeds formed the third leg of the Middle Passage when slavers returned home with cargoes full of hides, tobacco, sugar, and rum. Conditions aboard Guineamen were frequently unbearable for slaves and crewmen alike, and while slaves lacked daylight or movement, crewmen were forced to sleep on open decks to maximize the human cargo below. Most crewmen were forced into the slave trade by dishonest barkeeps in collusion with slavers, who fed them vast amounts of alcohol and when a given prospect drank beyond his ability to pay, their only choice was to sign on to Guineamen for impossibly low wages, taking the lives of an estimated 20% of crewmen during the 246-year history of slavery in North America. Profit-driven slave traders enjoyed reduced payouts due to crew fatalities, while many of those who survived the return trip to Europe or America were frequently cheated out of wages altogether. Crewmen frequently raped female slaves below deck, 
While many slaves resisted their imprisonment through hunger strikes or suicide jumps from Guineaman decks. Over the centuries, many African tribesmen, such as the crew, developed a reputation of proud resistance to the prospect of enslavement, leading to mass suicides that severely impacted a slave trader's bottom line. The number of deaths caused by suicide or hunger strikes has been estimated at two million lives, while those who died during forced marches to African slave markets and brutal voyages to the New World took the lives of an estimated two million more, making slavery in the Middle Passage one of the worst inhumanities in the history of man. I want to hear you say your name. Your name is Toby. What's your name? Gunta. Lord God, help that boy. They're gonna whip him dead. What's your name? Say it! Toby! Who are you? Say your name. What's your name? Toby. Hi. Say it again. Say it louder so they all can hear you. What's your name? Toby. My name is Toby. Hi. That's a good nigger. Cut him down. Today, I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood and took an oath to my people. It is very appropriate that from this cradle of the Confederacy, this very part of the great Anglo-Saxon Southland, that today we sound the drum for freedom. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. But Birmingham is a city under siege, ruled by a strict segregationist, Chief of Public Safety Bull Connor, determined to foil every move they make. You can never whip these boys if you don't keep you and them separate. I found that out in Birmingham. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. And he deploys the hoses and the dogs, and that is the turning point. It's awful to see an adult hosed down or attacked by a dog or beaten with a baton. It's a completely different thing to see a nine-year-old hosed down and really a nine-year-old who, who doesn't comprehend. That is a powerful message that gets sent out to the world. And it's one, unsurprisingly, that the world reacts to in horror, in shame, and in re-engagement with these movements. Those images, they are seared into the nation's brain. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. What will happen now? We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. 
Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. This is a CBS News special report. Dan Rather reporting for CBS News from New York. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was shot to death by an assassin late today as he stood on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King had planned to lead another civil rights march in Memphis next Monday. We got the latest on the story now from Russ Hodge, news director of WREC TV the intersection of the 5 and the 91 freeway. One thing we have been noticing, again, it's a very slow pursuit, travel, uh, followed by numerous uh, highway patrol vehicles. This is Robertson. Would you, uh, do you have the envelope with the seal break box, please? Yes, sir. All right, would you give those to Deputy Trower? Be still my heart. All right, Mr. Car Mr. Uh, Simpson, would you please stand and face the jury? This is Robertson. Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles. In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. The election of Barack Obama to the White House means a face of hope, a face of color, a voice, ears to hear the problems that have been ignored over the last eight years of the uh, Bush administration. So it is a face of hope. I work real hard, but I don't want anything tonight said to diminish the awesome work of Barack and Michelle. I mean, I play the role, a lot of us play the roles between 54 and 08, but uh, this campaign has been a transforming, redemptive, redemptive experience, and we should all just, just uh, marinate in that for a moment.
been just a collection of individuals. Or Well, that was a roller coaster, a bunch of highs and lows that was a tiny percentage of Judah's incredible history. I, for one, didn't celebrate OJ's verdict. He had long abandoned the black culture before that. Also, hard to celebrate when there were people killed. But that's also an extreme example of how we have had to latch onto any small triumph. Because we have been on the wrong end so many times. Even though the election of Barack Obama was a milestone, has our situation fared any better? How does Judah look today? I'm interested in your feedback. Please comment in the section below. Meanwhile, take a look at some of these other clips and let us know how you feel. Your bloodline is priesthood? A police sergeant in Indiana has been charged with two felonies after newly released officer body cam video allegedly shows him stomping on a man's head. We're not going to do this, right? Stop. Stop. What? You're done. You're done. You're done. Eric Huxley, a 14-year veteran of the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police, has been charged with battery with moderate physical injury and official misconduct. These charges stem from an arrest made on September 24th for alleged disorderly conduct. The suspect was handcuffed and on the ground when Huxley allegedly kicked him in the face. Right? Stop! You're done! What? Your bloodline is priesthood? very symbolic uh, moment, of course. So then they went into the library and Pope Francis gave Pope Benedict XVI a small icon of uh, Our Lady of Humility. And he said, well, the first person I thought of when I saw this icon was you. Well, of course, again, expressing and extending his gratitude for the eight years of his papacy. And they went on into a very informal uh, lunch. And then he flew back uh, uh, to uh, the Vatican with the same helicopter. It means they can tell if you've been there or not. <laughs> they can find out whether you've been there. Y'all heard what I'm saying? Is this too much? No. Now, this is, my, this is what my daughter did. This is, she, she went and did it for me because the DNA passes down from your father. That's why the Bible said the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the bloodline comes from your daddy. So the seed will come from me. All the seeds, all the bloodline comes from the father. So the DNA that, that passed all the way back to the original man came through my father's side. Now, this is what I want to show y'all because this is where now Stisha did a DNA test, which she would have my DNA. You got what I'm saying? Now, if you, I don't know, if, I know it's kind of small. It's hard for y'all to see it, but basically, this is what the DNA tells us when African Americans do a DNA swab and find out what our DNA test is. It says that 80% African. Now, if you look at the map, it's saying where we come from, which is right, right in where Nigeria is. Right where Nigeria and Ghana and uh, Congo, right on that horn of Africa, right on that curve. 
which is which is accurate. It's actually accurate. Now I'm gonna show y'all why they say we were Africans. Because you know this is where you gotta really put your put your thinking on right here. They say we were Africans. So so now listen, your DNA is gonna go back to a people group that was from that area. So that means if your people was in this area for any length of time, your DNA is gonna go back there. And the problem is the DNA of the African American doesn't really fit in Africa. What? But it goes back to Africa because that's the only place that they saw us at was in Africa. Because we were in Africa at one time. Because remember I said in 70 AD, we fled from Jerusalem down through, it says we went down through Sudan, through Ethiopia. We kept going down to Africa, to, to the west, to the west. Oh, uh, y'all got what I'm saying? So this is my, this is, this is, this is my, this would be my DNA in my family. This is my on, my, on my father's side. This is, this is, uh, this is what our makeup is. So if you see, it's 80% African, which is basically a surety. We're from that we're from the continent of Africa. And it's telling us the most concentrated place is right there on that horn of Africa. Now let me. Now I'm, I'm gonna get a little deep on y'all. So keep your mind up, Amen. Don't get your get, don't put your hungry mind down. When your mind is hungry, you tend to wander because your because your stomach is talking. I'm trying to help. This is this is deep. I'm, if, 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 you, if you get this, man, you, you I'm telling you, it's gonna change who you th- how you see yourself. Now, yeah, let me explain this. DNA haplotype is genetics. It's, haplotype is a combination of closely linked DNA sequences on one chromosome that are often inherited together. That means when they look at your chromosome, they're looking for a certain type that's on your chromosome so they can identify, right? Now, DNA haplogroup is a set of similar haplotypes inherited together or a group who shares a set of similar haplotypes used to understand genetic lineages. In other words, your, the group is based all have the same haplotype. That's how you find out. So what they have done, what, G, what DNA is, they went all over the world, every people group, they took their DNA, and that's why when you go and get your DNA, they already got people's DNA already mapped out everywhere in the world, so they know what, whatever your DNA come up, whatever your code is, they already got it on file. They say, okay, this is where you're from, and you can't, you, there ain't, no way, ain't no way to beat it. Ain't no way to beat that. So this, that's definitive, say definitive proof. Okay, so our DNA, our DNA, and what I want to show y'all is our haplogroup of African Americans is all the same. So you go get your own DNA test, but it's all the same because they, 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 they found out that the African American ha- haplogroup is the same. Not like Africans. What? I'm going to show you. I'm going to give it to you so you look it up for yourself. Now let me show you. Genetic group. Our, 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 our haplogroup is E1B1A. That's what that would be that was that's what your hap, uh, African American uh, haplo group would be, right? You got that. This haplo group is found predominantly among the Bantu Negro, descended to include but not limited to the African Limba, West African tribes, Igbo. Remember that's very important. Igbo Jews in Africa, African Americans, West Indians, Brazilians, Haitians, and other Negro influenced race throughout the Caribbean and scattered across different nations. Contrary to false DNA reporting, this is not sub-Saharan or hermetic haplogroup. It is Semitic. That's that's everything. I just told you everything. What? That means it's not hermetic. So that ham is where you get the Africans from. Kush, Ethiopia, uh, uh, um, uh, Miserum, uh, Egypt. It's saying we're not from them. We're not from sub-Saharan Africa. We're Semitic. This is telling you, you're not of, you're not of, that's saying I'm not, you're not of ham. You have Shem. What? Oh, uh, this is what your this is if you are a if, now 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 why now, now why is what I'm telling y'all why is this group important? Because there are people the Bantus, which is which is now the Limba tribe in Africa right now, million of them still original Hebrews that did not leave Africa. Remember, they ran out of Jerusalem, down in Africa. They still over practicing Judaism. They know exactly who they are. They took their DNA and found out that their DNA is not. Now, the, the African DNA is E1B1B. That's African DNA. But the, but, 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 but the Shemite DNA is BE1B1A. So the Limba tribe in Africa, that's Jews. They know they Jews, no doubt about it. They're E1B1A, which means that E1B1A. Now, 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 why is it important? Because they knew they got they got they had DNA from Aaron. 
Moses' brother. Moses' brother was the the Levites. Y'all got that? Moses' brother, Moses' brother, DNA, Aaron, they know is E1B1A. Now, if Moses' brother, which means he got that DNA from his father, so that means that's what Moses' DNA was. So the so the children of Israel, that's their DNA. What? Just let it sink in. What? Your bloodline is priesthood? What? Your bloodline is priesthood? What? Your bloodline is priesthood?